how we trained them, what we used them for, and all that good stuff. So, the breed of dog is Border Collie. We originated on the borders of Scotland and England. Our close affiliation with England for some 800 years means we have these dogs in Ireland a very long time. I'm going to put this dad in the cage because he's going to drive me off my head. <laughs> Just to direct your head, poking you. You think I'm their mother. <laughs> now, so yeah, so since about 1906, there's a stud book for these dogs, and that means that their breeding is recorded. So it just gives us a better chance of getting a decent border collie, a decent working dog. So that's Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales, and that's the International Sheepdog Society. So nowadays, the DNA tested as well, so we know exactly what we're breeding to and from. Now, that doesn't guarantee a success either. So you're not guaranteed anything in this world, as you know. So we breed from the best to the best, but we don't always get the best. So when they're little puppies, we sort of have to assess them. So when they get to the age of about seven months to a year, we start to look at them a little bit more seriously, and we start to see have they got this crazy need to work. So basically a decent border collie has to be an addict. And the drug is livestock. So they have to be addicted to work, unlike myself. Now, if we see this addiction, we start to train them. And the first thing we do is we take them away from the sheep and cattle, and we bring them somewhere there's no distraction. So we bring them into a little paddock, and we teach them to stop. The most important command on a working dog is to be able to stop him. If you can't stop him, you're not in control of the situation, and of course you're not in control of the livestock. So if you're working sheep or cattle near a slip edge, or near a busy road, or near the sea, if you can't stop the dog, you cannot stop the livestock. So we take them into a little paddock, and we teach them to lie down and to come straight to us. Lie down, that'll do. So they're the first two commands we teach the dog. Now, the reason we get the young dog to come straight to us is that eventually we're going to be teaching the dog to select or shed sheep. And that's the start of teaching the dog to come in and take sheep out of the flock. So everything we do with the dogs, there's a reason for it. So lie down, that'll do. Now, we then introduce the dog to sheep. Now, there's lots of different types of these dogs. Just because they're border collies doesn't mean to say that they are all react the same when they see sheep. And some of them will actually run away from the sheep, which isn't much good. Some of them have a thing called too much eye, so they get stuck staring at the sheep so they can't move. <laughs> so we call those too sticky or too eye. Some of them, some of them um, are too far off the sheep, so they lose contact with the sheep. And some of them are just not good out to the working dogs, and that's it. So, even though we're breeding from superstars, we're not guaranteed success. So, we start to train the good dog. The, the good dog has to have a few things. It's like baking a cake, and you have to have all the ingredients. And if you're missing half the ingredients, you don't get a good cake, and that's the same with the working dog. So, they have to have this thing we call power and push. And what that means is, when they walk up to the sheep, they say to the sheep, move. And the sheep says, no. And the dog says, what did <laughs> so the dog that has power will walk right up to the sheep and say to the sheep, move or else. And uh, the sheep will turn around and leave. Now the weak dog might look the same, could be bigger or smaller, or something different. They'll get out the sheep and they'll say to the sheep, you're looking fantastic. Is there any possibility you might move? And what will happen then is the sheep will have a look at the dog and the dog might give a little bit of ground, maybe step back a little bit or something like that. And the sheep will give them that hand with their head so they will break your leg. So don't think for a second that the sheep will say, oh my God, here comes the dog. They're saying, here comes the dog. Does the dog have what it takes to move us? And we call that power and push. Now, if we see they have all that stuff, we need to use them to the sheep. So here we have the sheep. They're not great looking sheep, but they're sheep. <laughs> Now, the end of my crook here represents the dog. Here's the sheep and the shepherd. The natural instinct of a border collie is always to try and get to the opposite side of the sheep. So if I walk in this direction, the dog will automatically go to 12 o'clock. 
If I walk in this direction, 12 o'clock. So no matter where I go, that young dog will always, like a weather vane. Now what might happen at the very start is, they might hold the sheep into the corner of the field, or they might hold the sheep to an older dog. But we put up the older dog, we never trade one dog off another, because you give them very, very bad habits. They start to look at the older dog, instead of looking at the legs. So, we get out in the field with the young dog, and we get him to bring the sheep after. So we're doing a hell of a lot of walking backwards around the field, saying to the young dog, steady, 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 walking backwards, steady. And then we start to put what we call sides on the dog, left and right. Now because the dog is automatically at 12 o'clock, if I keep walking to the left, and I keep repeating the command, very quickly we're going to get a side. Come by, come by. Means left, away, away to me. Means right. Okay? So now we have the dog known as left and it's right. Now the reason we do that is, the natural instinct, as I said, is for the dog to be at 12 o'clock. If I can get that dog over here, and I can move that dog to the left, or to the right, I can teach the dog to drive the sheep away from us, as well as bring the sheep to us. So we can use the dog to push the sheep up the mountain, as well as take them down, right? So we call that driving. Now sheep and cattle have eyes in the side of their head, they have peripheral vision, they can see behind them, so naturally enough they can see the dog when the dog is behind them, so if we move the dog from left to right, we can move the sheep wherever we want. And that's why we put, um, come by and away to me. Now you can use lots of different commands. We have lots of different commands for different dogs. Now, the next thing we teach the dog is to go and get the sheep. We call this the out one. Now, we have our young dog stop him, so the dog is automatically going to be at 12 o'clock. So we say to the young dog, come by, which is to the left. The dog will go around the sheep, bring the sheep back to me, and we'll do the same on the right. I will keep making the distance greater. So I'll start at 50 meters, then 100 meters, then 200 meters, and eventually these dogs will go a mile or more for sheep. But that's how we start. If the dog is going wrong, we stop the dog and we redirect. Now, the last thing we put on the dogs are whistles. You're very lucky you're getting a lovely morning because for the last week it's rained. It's going to start building an ark if it's raining that much. Now, so. We put whistles on the dog because naturally enough they're not going to hear us if we're a mile away on the mountain. They won't hear your voice, but they will hear a whistle. So, a typical lie down whistle. Let's say you have a domestic dog at home, in whatever nationality, whatever country, or whatever you say to the dog, all you have to do is just train yourself before you train the dog. So, a simple little sit, sit, sit. After about the third or fourth time, you go. Yeah. So we have different whistles for left, different whistles for right, different whistles for lie down, we get up all sorts of different whistles. Different whistles for different dogs, so we can walk the dog independently of each other. Now we're going to show you the dogs doing a bit of work. So we have two dogs here today, we have Maggie who is six years old, and we have Rose here who is heading for, heading for two now. And uh, Rose is... 99.9% trained. She's not 100% trained. But Maggie, Maggie is, uh, the two of them are addicts, as you can see. The more I talk, they know when they're coming to the system. You can see them, they're running around, and then eventually they start to turn around and look down at that. They're looking at sheep, yeah? So what we do is we send them, what we send Maggie, come here, Ross. Ah, you're all right, sit there. Now, so, we'll, we'll, we'll show you the dog going for the sheep. So, you want the dog to go on my left or my right?
strong mentally as well as physically, yeah? The dog isn't strong mentally. They're not able to take training. So when you start to train them, they would actually leave the field. So they need to be strong up here as well as here, yeah? Now, we'll show you the dog driving the sheep away. So... Mm -hmm. You want to pick somewhere in the field, you want me to put the shoe. Anywhere. Where? <laughs> so, we'll go where we go. We'll come up here and we'll show you the dog selecting or shedding the sheep, right? of the year we need the dog to take sheep out of the flock. Just now we're in lambing season so the dogs will be doing, wait, we're doing a hell of a lot of taking sheep out every day. So we, we'll, uh, we'll show you the dog shedding or selecting out a few sheep. So <clears throat> the natural thing is for the dog to be at 12 o'clock. As I said to you there, we teach the dog to lie down and come to us. So when we're teaching a young dog like Rose, we just make a gap in the sheep and we call her through. And we get her used to coming through on one side and then we take the sheep. So we'll show you with my weight. Now sheep don't like being selected. They don't like being taken away from the buddy. Oh. <laughs> so 
Well, it's her job to hold those sheep from the other sheep, yeah? Wow. So that's her job until I tell her to go back and get those other sheep. Mm -hmm. All right, Maggie. Are you listening to me? Come on. Maggie, look back. Come here. This is how intent a barnacle is. Look, she's not interested in me at all. <laughs> hey, wow. hey. Come here. Come here. Come I normally have a round pen here, but there's such a lot here today, I had to make it up here. Like, come by, come by, lie down, wait, lie down. So, what we use, Rose! <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, rose. It's predominantly, like, uh, it's predominantly for their meat. Years ago, it was all about the wool, but unfortunately now there's very little price for wool. So we have a few different breeds of sheep. These white sheep are Wicklow Cheviot sheep. Watch, lay like, down. Uh, and they're they're indigenous to the mountains behind us. This girl here and this girl on, like, on the outside. These are out of the Cheviot sheep by the Black Face Suffolk Rams. Not doing a very good job of holding sheep. <laughs> <laughs> lay, come on, lay down. Maybe, lay down. Stay there. Maybe if I get the other side. Um, yeah. So, so nowadays, as I said, it's all about producing meat. So these speckled sheep, and this is a Texel cross with a champion. They have more weight gain off grass, so they're better for us for producing meat. Unfortunately, watch, there's no real market for wool, so it's all about producing meat. Gestation period for a sheep is five months. We put the males with the females typically around the end of October into November, and we start to lamb from Paddy's Day onwards, the 17th of March. So, all around this area here, we're fairly close to the mountains, so it can be quite cold. So grass growth doesn't come for a little bit later than maybe down further south or over even over where you are today, over the other side of the mountain, the grass comes quicker. So um, it's all about grass. It's all about getting as many lambs fit for sale off grass. Years ago, wool was worth an awful lot of money. The wealthiest nations in the world would have had the most wool. And unfortunately, since about the 1930s, wool production has gone this way. Um, to give you an example, up the road here, 